The Worm in the Apple is Peter Bremelow's new book on what he sees as wrong with American schooling and how to fix it. This talk from the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. is 55 minutes. To begin our forum, I'd like to note that this coming April will be the 20th anniversary of the Nation at Risk, the Presidential Commission report that uh, on the status of American education that noted the medio mediocre performance of our nation's students in schools. Since 1983, when that report was released, we have witnessed a host of changes that have had almost no significant impact on any aspect of education. Now, 20 years later, we witnessed the release of another Presidential Commission report, uh, this one by the U.S. Commission on National Security, which concluded that our systems of basic scientific research and education are in serious crisis. This week, the Coret K-12 Task Force on Education will release its report. This is a, a group comprised of some of the nation's most um, um, pro, uh, le leading education researchers. Their report, uh, again to be released this week, comes to essentially the same conclusion, that uh, not much has really changed. The public education establishment, of course, points to a number of reforms over the last 20 years, the most recent being accountability. But again, if you look at the evidence, not too much has really changed. Only about 30% of students graduating from American high schools could read an article or could read a magazine like Forbes, largely due to the failure of our government-run school system. Financial journalist Peter Brimelow brings some new insights into the reasons why not much has changed. In a 1993 Forbes cover story, Brimelow labeled the National Education Association, the NEA, the National Extortion Association, and revealed probably for the first time in a major magazine the stranglehold that the teacher unions have over schools and politics. In his new book, The Worm and the Apple, Brimelow argues that no education reform, however worthy, can succeed unless something is done about the power and opposition of the teacher unions. After evaluating the public school system from an economist's perspective, he concludes that the public school system has been captured by a rent-seeking parasite, the teacher unions, whom Brimelow calls the teacher trust because their combined power resembles that of a monopoly, shutting out competition and reform. <laughs> Brimelow exposes how the unions, particularly the National Education Association and the American Federation of Teachers, are the real obstacle to creating a better education system. With their proliferating state affiliates, they constitute a formidable obstacle in any reforms that would decrease their power or control over America's schools or teachers. In The Worm and the Apple, Brimelow also outlines some practical measures that would bust the teacher trust. Brimelow is a CBS Market Watch columnist and former senior editor at both Forbes and National Review. He is currently an editor of the internet journal VDARE and is a senior fellow with the Pacific Research Institute. Peter will speak to us for about 20 minutes, after which we'll have an opportunity to hear some remarks by Jay Matthews, who I will introduce at that time. So without further ado, please help me welcome Peter Brimelow. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the, the Cato for having me here today. It's an act of great libertarian charity, <laughs> for various reasons that I won't go into right now. Uh, we've had some disagreements. Uh, it, when Chekhov Finn uh, reviewed my book, A Worm in the Apple, for, for the Washington Times, he said a number of nice things that I'm too modest to quote, but he did say uh, this book is as, about as subtle as a two by four applied forcefully to your skull. Uh, of course, of course, we regarded this as a compliment. Uh, so in that spirit, and in case any of you want to take the next 20 minutes for a nap, I'll, I'll, I'll say now the two points that are critical in this book, in my opinion. One of them is that cost matters. You have to look at education, at output of the education system, not just in terms of the quality of its results, but in terms of how much it costs. There's a whole cost dimension, which I think is disregarded completely in most public debate. And the second point is that 
the legal environment matters. The legal environment, not just of education in general, but for the teacher unions in particular, uh, because it's legal privileges that, that have made that union so powerful and have allowed to get its death grip on, on, uh, on the current system. So cost matters, uh, cost matter, and, and law matters. In many respects, this isn't a book about education, it's a book about law and economics. Um, Twenty years ago, uh, at the time of the Nation at Risk report, I was at Fortune. Uh, and Fortune is a kind of a top-down organisation. It's not at all like Cato. And they came to us and said, came to me and said, uh, "You have to write a story on uh, the crisis in the public schools." And I said, uh, "This was kind of a bad idea because." One thing, I hadn't been to an American public school, obviously, uh, and secondly, I didn't have any children at the time and had no first-hand experience. And thirdly, uh, it was summer and all the schools were closed. And they responded, this will make you objective. <laughs> and uh, guess what? They were right. I approached the education system uh, like uh, as a financial journalist would we'll approach any industry, or the baked bean industry. Uh, I, you don't pontificate about uh, well, the best way to get baked beans into the can. Uh, you simply look uh, to see which is the most efficient firm at doing that, uh, as revealed by the, by the, the profit and loss statement, the, uh, the, the, well, the bottom line. Uh, and it looked at in this uh, uh, light, the, the history of the last 20 years is quite different. I mean, you can't show that there's been a substantial increase in scores uh, for, in, in the K through 12 uh, kids, uh, the 17 year olds, the output, uh, since, uh, since the, the early 80s. In fact, in some respects, there's been a decline. But you can see easily that there's an enormous increase in costs. A per pupil expenditure in real terms was then around about 5,000 a year, and it's now around about 7,500. Current expenditures, uh, about 7,500 a year. Uh, uh, there are never any productivity gains in the American uh, uh, education system. In spite of computers, in spite of Xerox machines, in spite of videos, which spe kids spend a lot more time watching in school than you would like to think. It's a unique situation. And, uh, and, uh, and that's, so that's the first and great moral of this book is look, we have to look at the cost situation. There are some public, public schools in the US that do get good results. It's a very variegated system, but they're invariably very expensive. That's not an angle that anybody ever looks at. Now, when you, when you approach as a financial journalist, you immediately see that the problem here is socialism. I used to say that uh, socialism being the, uh, the government ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. Uh, I used to say, uh, uh, for 20 years I've been writing on this question, I used to compare the, the, the American government school system to the Soviet farm system, which uh, to, uh, had, seven, you know, to, had turned Russia from being a grain importer, exporter to being a grain importer, and had 70 years of bad weather at harvest. And then the Soviet farm system went away. So I can't use the analogy anymore, but the American school system is, is still here. And you can see that there are, there are uh, five, I distinguish five uh, key characteristics of socialism in the system. One is the political allocation of resources. Decisions are made about, about who should spend money on what on a political basis. Uh, that one example being the mainstreaming in, the, in recent years, the mainstreaming streaming of uh, handicapped or special ed children. Uh, the, uh, it's on, on a wholly mistaken analogy, an emotional uh, uh, an analogy, with, with segregation, that it would be wrong to somehow keep them out of the, the, the mainstream classrooms and to segregate them in special classrooms. This, this decision was made without any regard to the efficiency or effectiveness or really what, what the parents made. It's a political decision. Another aspect, a second aspect of socialism that you can, you can identify is, is proliferating overhead. I mean, uh, I presume you all know here that, in fact, the, the ratio of, of teachers to um, uh, of, of pupils to teachers has been collapsing for as long as we've had numbers. It was it was uh, about 22, 23 in 1970. It's down to about 16 now. Uh, so there are ever more uh, teachers relative to pupils. What's less obvious is that. Uh, other adults in the system is also growing. Uh, uh, in the 1950s, there will be about two and a half, for every two and a half teachers, there was another adult in the system, an administrator, a secretary, or guidance counselor, or something. Uh, now it's virtually one to one. There's a tremendous, uh, tremendous growth of, of overhead in that system. A third aspect of socialism is the, uh, the chronic mismatching of supply and demand. In, uh, in the Soviet Union, it took the form of the, uh, the left boot factory outproducing the, the right boot factory. Uh, in uh, in the, the school system, it takes the form of periodic gluts and shortages in key areas. 
uh, it shows up particularly at the tourist level, the car level. But I, I see recently, I was out in California this week, and they begin to speculate that they might have a glut of teachers there uh, very shortly. Now, the fourth, and in some ways the most interesting aspect of socialism that you see in the school system, is panaceas, the endless quest for top-down panaceas. They have to be top-down panaceas because nothing comes up from the bottom. There's no system market or market process that, that would allow it to come up from the bottom. In the Soviet Union, it took the system of, uh, it took the form of um, uh, plowing the virgin lands or using more chemical fertilizers, uh, preferably bought with Western bank loans. In, uh, in the American school system, it takes the form of open classrooms, or closed class classrooms, or just a jar classrooms, or any kind of classroom, of various pedagogical fads that sweep through the system from time to time. Now, uh, as, as, as uh, David mentioned, I, I argue in this book that the major part of this problem is the teacher trust, the teacher union. But I don't say that getting rid of the teacher trust, uh, breaking its power, is a panacea. There will still be problems in the government school system uh, after the teacher trust's power is broken. For one thing, we're going to have to educate the kids, it's going to be a problem. I just, so I don't see that t breaking the power of the teacher trust is a panacea, but I do say it's a prerequisite. And the fifth uh, aspect of, uh, of uh, socialism that we see in the government school system is, the, is qualitative and quantitative collapse. Well, so much, so much for the apple itself. I'm, not, I'm now going to turn to the worm, the, the teacher trust. As David said, uh, the problem with the government, one of the problems with the government school system is that it's been, it's been captured by what I describe as the teacher trust in homage to the great trust that arose at the end of the 19th century and are exposed by other muckraking journalists. Uh, the, the, uh, the NEA with about uh, two and a half million members, the AFT with about a million members, working now very closely together. Uh, as David said, in one of our stories in Forbes, we described this as the National Extortion Association. But this wasn't meant to be a criticism. Uh, simply, I was simply describing the way they operate. I mean, the way the union operates is it uses political power, its monopoly power over labour supply, to extort benefits from the system. It's, it, the teachers are rewarded not on the basis of whether they're good teachers, but on the basis of uh, do they belong to a union that's strong enough to force uh, the, 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 the school board to pay them this or that. It used to be said at the end of the 19th century that the tariff was the mother of trusts. In other words, because you didn't have, because you couldn't bring in low-cost imports, therefore the, the low-cost imports couldn't undermine domestic monopolies. The tariff was the mother of trusts. I would say that this, uh, the government school system is the mother of the teacher trust. Because it is a political bureaucracy, it's, intense, it's, in, it's exquisitely sensitive to political pressure, and the teacher trust is in the business of applying political pressure. Uh, and it's able to do that on, a, on a, an exclusive basis, be able to interpose itself between, between the school board and the parents and anybody else. In effect, the inmates are now running the asylum in American education. Uh, there's a wonderful quote from Terry Moore at the Hoover Institute, which has just produced the correct report that, that you mentioned uh, on this question. This is his, 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 uh, his insight into the teacher union effect on the government schools, quoting. He said, uh, there are rules, of course, about pay and fringe benefits, but there are also rules about hiring, firing, layoffs and promotion. The rules about how teachers are to be evaluated and how the evaluation can be used. The rules about the assignments of teachers to classrooms and their non-assignment to yard duty, lunch duty, hall duty and after school activities. The rules about how much time the teacher can be required to work and how much time they must get to prepare for class. The rules about class schedules. The rules about how the students are to be disciplined. The rules about homework. The rules about class size, rules about the number and use of teachers' aid, rules about the school calendar, rules about role of, the role of teachers in school policy decisions, rule about how, rules about how grievances are to be handled, rules about staff development and time off for professional meetings, rules about who has to join the union, rules about whether their dues be automatically deducted from their paychecks, rules about union use of school facilities and more. And he went on to say that the teacher union's greatest power is not the ability to get what they want, but rather they build to block what they don't want and thus to stifle all education reforms that are somehow threatening to their interests. I'm going to say three things, about, oh actually there are four things here about the teacher union. Uh, excuse me a second. The first and most important, the first is that it's a new phenomenon. The National Education Association excuse me, has been around for a long time since the Civil War but it only really became a union in the 1960s. 
for, 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 until then, even union enthusiasts like uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, D. Roosevelt and, uh, and George Meany of the AFL-CIO thought it was unthinkable, regarded as unthinkable, that public sector un uh, sh the public sector should, could ever unionize. Uh, they, they thought it was, it was uh, impossible because it would be a monopoly on a monopoly, a monopoly uh, on, on a supplier in a monopoly industry. In fact, in the case of education, there's a third level of monopoly, which is the compulsory attendance laws that you can you force to consume by law. They thought it was unthinkable, and they were right. It has produced a monster. In the 1960s, uh, for the first time, public sector, the public sector was allowed to unionize, and, and, and the teachers did unionize very quickly. And uh, in 1976, the, the, the NEA, or as late as 1976, the NEA endorsed its first presidential candidate. The second point uh, I'd like to uh, make is that um, the, the union unionization of the teachers was not inevitable. As it turned out, right at the point where the uh, union model was pushed through in education, unionization in the private sector started to go into a free fall. One of the big problems that the teacher trust has now is that it's very hard to convince Generation Xers to join the labor unions. They just don't think in terms that the Depression generation did. Uh, they're much more used to, be, to being in, in, independent. It wasn't inevitable. There are many other mo models of, uh, of uh, it's, um, uh, uh, employer employee relations than, than the industrial labor union. The third point I think is it worth grasping about the teacher union is that it's on, it seems to me to be unstable. It's one of these glitches that sometimes happen in a, in a fluid uh, but dynamic, uh, a structured but dynamic uh, economy like the US where some group accidentally gets itself in a position to extort rents from the rest of the system. An example I would give would be stockbrokers in the 1960s before negotiated commission rates or airline pilots before regulation, uh, deregulation or to some extent trial lawyers now with the interaction of the contingent fee system on the one hand and the, the liability crisis on the other. What happens to these things is that for a while the group will benefit and then people, other people wake up to it and make it go away. And that's the fourth point about the teacher union. It can be made to go away. It's critically dependent on legal privileges. There's a wide range of these, uh, which I go into in, in, in Worm in the Apple. But, the two, but to simplify, I mean, obviously one of them was the ability to, to form a union at all and bargain, bargain collectively, uh, which, which, which was illegal until uh, the 1960s. But uh, the, the two most important, uh, to simplify, is, is compulsory monopoly bargaining. In other words, if there's a collective bargaining law where a group of teachers can get together and force the, uh, the, the, the union, uh, the school board, to recognize them as the exclusive representative of all teachers. Uh, the second uh, legal privilege are agency fee laws. Can they tax the teachers who don't want to obey, join the union? Uh, uh, in vote, about 30 states they can, and that enormously enhances the, the, their power. Belonging to a union is not cheap, you know, it's over five, six hundred dollars for teachers. This is a large amount of money. Now, uh, so I'll conclude. What's to be done? Two things. Clean, first of all, we have, to, we have to clean the apple. We have to disinfect the apple. I believe that's... Um, that, uh, and the second thing is, is we have to extract the worm. What this means is that markets are both a means and an end in education. By marketizing education, uh, we, can, we, we will significantly weaken the power of the union through vouchers and tax credits and so on, and that's why they don't want to do it. Uh, the, the, second, but the, the second point, and what I think is unique to this book, uh, I, I list in the, fi the final chapter of the book about 25 ways in which the legal b privileges of the union can be removed. The, 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 the teacher trust can be broken. It can be busted. It could be done on antitrust theory, uh, breaking into separate states. You can do it state by state with collective bargaining laws. There's a lot that could be done. I'm going to finish on an optimistic, uh, I am finishing, on an optimistic note. Uh, uh, or at any rate, I've got some news that's so bad that it becomes good. Uh, I think in some ways the most interesting single statistic about the school system, the government school system right now, is not costs, or fascinated though I am, I am by costs, but the graduation rate. If you look at the graduation rate from, from American 17-year-olds, in, in 1900 it was only about 6%. Then it rose exponentially through the century, but, it, but at the time of the Second World War, only about half of 17-year-olds uh, were actually graduating from high school. In other words, Hitler was defeated uh, by a nation of high school dropouts. 
it peaked in about 1968, 69 at 77% of the, of the cohort, the 17 year olds. And it's never gotten above that. It's moved sideways and in recent years it's actually deteriorated sharply uh, to, be, to, below, to well below 70%, uh, a development which hasn't attracted very much attention for some reason. Now there are two possible explanations for this. One is, uh, is that there is really something absolutely chronically wrong with the education system, that it can't do what it's setting out to do. And it is, it is highly interesting uh, that, uh, that this uh, graduation rate stall occurred right about the time that the schools unionized. Well, the second, in some ways more pervasive uh, telling uh, uh, possibility, is that in fact it's not going to be possible to graduate all kids from high school. There's never been a golden age in American education where most kids graduate from high school. Uh, and there isn't, it doesn't look like there's going to be one. In, uh, in um, Worm, I quote, I quote, I look at, have numbers that suggest that of, of white 17 year olds, looking only at whites with IQs below 75, about. Uh, about uh, nearly half of them graduate from high school, which is very commendable. But these people are verging on being technically retarded. What does this mean about the quality of the high school degree? Uh, we may be trying to do an impossible thing here. The second uh, bit of, uh, of uh, uh, good news is, is, uh, is, is the homeschooling revolution. Uh, between half a million and a million and a half kids have been homeschooled at the moment. It's very hard to get good numbers on this, but it's, it's vastly larger than it used to be. Now, of course, this is a result of legal changes. Uh, Homeschools in every state had to force the state to recognize that they were, uh, they, they, they homeschooling was a way of meeting their compulsory attendance laws. Now, I'm a father of two small children, and it's amazing to me that anybody could homeschool a child without murdering it. It's just, or in the case of teenagers, uh, in the case of teenagers being murdered by it. But if you talk to homeschoolers, what they say is, oh, it's simple, because in fact, they only teach the kid about two hours a day. One, one, uh, one parent said to me recently, I said, what does he do with the rest of his time? He said, he plays video games. <laughs> Wish my little boy would be heaven. <clears throat> well, so in other words, what this the good news here is that, that there's a lot more flexibility in the education process than we think. Uh, the substantive content of education could probably be delivered a lot faster in terms of hours, uh, uh, in many fewer hours in the day, and probably many fewer years in, in the kid's life than we, than, uh, than, than we, um, than it is at the moment. Uh, so in fact, there are probably ways to resolve these questions uh, effectively and efficiently. Well, this is exactly the kind of solution that the, uh, the teach union, education, educrats in general, and the teach union in particular, don't want to look into, because they want to have more clients in the system. They will be very happy, ladies and gentlemen, if all of you were still in school. Thanks very much. We'll now be pleased to hear some comments by Jay Matthews. Jay is an education reporter and columnist for the Washington Post, where he has been a local, national, foreign, and business correspondent for the last 35 years, 32 years. Matthews's fourth book, Class Struggle, What's Wrong and Right with America's Best Public High Schools, was published by Times Book in March 1998. It was the first detailed look at the dynamics of elite public high schools. Excerpted in Newsweek, it ranked the nation's most challenging schools and revealed how schools denied many students a chance to take their most challenging courses. His rating system for high schools, known as the Challenge Index, is used in Newsweek magazine and several other news organizations and by school districts. His new book on college admissions is called Harvard Smarvard, and it's uh, scheduled to be released this month. His column, Class Struggle, now appears each Tuesday in the Washington Post on uh, website. He won the 1999 Benjamin Fine Award for Outstanding Education Reporting for both his feature writing and column writing. We're grateful to have him with us today, Jay Matthews. Thanks, David. I have to correct David slightly. It's, it's certain pe people of certain parts of the country can't pronounce the title of my new book. It's Harvard Schmarver. You have to give it a real Yiddish shr. Uh, and I grew up in California. I'm not sure why I'm able to do this, but obviously I've, I grew up with a lot of good friends who knew how to pronounce these words. Um, I want to congratulate Peter on what is a terrific book. Uh, it, it's provocative. Uh, I learned a great deal from it. Um, it's the kind of book that if you had a as he, as he recognized in his remarks, a, a business writer or a political writer here, there'd be almost no quibbles. I mean, he really uh, takes the, um, um, the um, Chicago School, the University of Chicago critique of American education into 
uh, the uh, union situation and uh, tears it up on, and reveals things that I think are absolutely um, uh, wonderful for people to know. It's well worth the $24.95. And I suspect its impact on politics is going to be just as great. Uh, uh, we're at the beginning of the election cycle, and uh, any political consultant who has to work for any Republican candidate is going to be attacked by a Democratic candidate, which means an NEA back candidate is going to love to have Peter's book. And there's going to be full of all kinds of rhetorical grenades that they can toss back at their opponents. So this is a very useful thing to have around. Um, I think its major strengths, uh, for me as a reader, and uh, you, I'm going to have some some quibbles and some complaints because I'm an education reporter and as as Peter pointed out it isn't so much an education book but as a business economic political book and so there's some things on the education side that I think bear mention. Um, the strengths in my view are um, you know first you know he has great fun with uh, pointing out the idiocy of of um, representative assemblies at the National Education Association the kind of of um, resolutions that pass for uh, you know supporting left-handed writing and uh, and doing something about uh, mail order brides the kind of things you see in such assemblies are you know beyond uh, ridicule um, there's also a great deal of very important reporting in Peter's book about the absolute clueless cluelessness of the particularly the NEA leadership about their members uh, and the the most telling and of course Peter reports this with great gloating glee in his book the most telling is the their failure in 1998 to uh, engineer this merger with the AFT, which they thought they had in the in the bag, and at the last minute they dis they discovered that their membership was wasn't on board at all, which is a great embarrassment. It showed how disconnected they were from from the needs and wants and thoughts of their their own members. Uh, and last but not least, there is a chapter in this book which is of telling critique of education reporters of people who cover the teachers unions, and I. I must say I agree with almost all everything that he says. Um, Peter points out that we rarely, we who consider ourselves, you know, education writers for big arrogant publications like mine, um, rarely cover the teachers unions. Uh, if you sent me off to one of these representative assemblies, um, you know, today I would, I would really be thrashing about. I, as Peter points out, I wouldn't understand the politics. I wouldn't understand the relationships. Uh, I'd make a mess of it. Now there's a reason why. Um, I don't cover teachers unions and I, I actually I'm so inspired by Peter's book I've done a, my online column tomorrow is about that so if you want to go on WashingtonPost.com tomorrow afternoon you'll see this in more detail but he's right uh, we're not covering the teacher unions very well and I think that's a very good point to make now weaknesses um, as Peter says he's not an education reporter although he he got into this and he got almost everything right he's the central point that he makes is that we are stuck uh, and have been stuck for the last 30 years at a, at a point in increasing achievement for American students. Uh, and we really don't know uh, what to do about that. I would quibble uh, Peter's analysis of uh, what happened to SAT scores in the 60s I think is a little bit overdrawn. Uh, there wasn't a great collapse, inexplicable collapse. There may have been a slight collapse and much of that decline in the 60s was due to the the, a significant change in the character of the people who are taking the tests. There are much many, many more kids taking the tests uh, from, from backgrounds that were very different from the kids who took the test 10 years before. Um, he, uh, um, uh, in one of his rare mentions of his own children, he buys into the notion that uh, we're, we're giving too much homework these days and quotes from a very, uh, I saw this quoted in the same way, in fact, I've seen it quoted in my same newspaper that, that homework uh, amount of time spent on homework by children 12 and under has increased 50 percent, actually it's 60 percent, um, from 1981 to 1997. This is based on a very uh, rigorous University of Michigan study, but when you actually look at the study, you show that this increase in homework time is like, you know, my increasing my bowling score. You know, if my bowling score goes up 60 percent, you think that's a big deal until you realize that my initial average was a 53. Um, the uh, the ho actual homework load in America based on this Michigan study has gone from uh, 20 minutes a school night to 30 minutes a school night over those uh, uh, 17 or 16 years. So uh, I don't think our children are overburdened and in fact my own um, diagnosis of the major problem with American education is that our children aren't very burdened at all and that the American educators um, are 
um, overburdened with the sense of kindness and, and humanity. That's what brings them into education, and they are they cri they cringe from the from the notion of putting students in situations where they're going to have to take risks in order to learn. That's my own characterization. Um, Peter's subtitle is wrong, though I, I've had some experience with subtitles, and publishers tend to want you to have subtitles that sort of grab whatever audience they think the book is, and, and I suspect Peter, you know, as I, I will give into that because he wrote the book straight, the subtitle is, is off. There's, nobody is, the teachers unions aren't destroying American education. There certainly could be argued that they're holding it back, but, you know, you just look at if that were true, if they were destroying American education, and then we would expect uh, Mississippi and Alabama, which have the weakest teachers unions, to be have the highest test scores, and Minnesota and Wisconsin, which have the strongest unions, to have the lowest test scores. And in fact, the opposite is true. The low test scores are in those weak union states, and the high test scores are in those strong union states. So that, that's, that's wrong, but I'm not going to uh, mark Peter for that, because I know what publishers do to you. Um, and I think, you know, looking at and, and I must confess that Peter quotes one of my stories very accurately in this, and I have to confess that I misled Peter writing a story in 1997 about my favorite teacher, Jaime Escalani, of, uh, East, uh, in East LA, Garfield High School in East Los Angeles, uh, in which uh, when he left the school, indeed the uh, teachers union reps at that school were crowing and taking this as a victory, their victory over a very firm, demanding teacher who because he's a middle class, middle class Bolivian, thought that NEA was, you know, that slightly left of Che Guevara, and he always celebrated the death of Che Guevara at the hands of the Bolivian army whenever he had a chance. Um, but, you know, that wasn't really the whole story of Escalante. The, the, the teachers union had very little impact on what happened at that school. Uh, Jaime ran roughshod over the union rep, who, Peter will be happy to learn, uh, the union rep at Garfield High School, who was, you know, complained a lot but had very little impact, uh, grew up in a British labor family. His parents were both born in um, in uh, England, and uh, one, of, one of the problems with immigration. <laughs> <laughs> well, that we have the good side, and then we have Jaime, which is the good, the the good side of immigration. Um, okay, so let's get to the my main point, um, and I I won't take much longer. because I know you want to ask some questions. Um, as I was reading this book, it occurred to me that what the situation he was describing with the NEA and teachers, and I've you know, been hanging around classrooms for 20 years, so I have a pretty good idea of what teachers feel about their union and how much the union affects what they do in the classroom, is very much like the effect of the newspaper guild on what happens inside the Washington Post. Um, editorial employees of the Washington Post and most other large newspapers are represented by a large uh, union, which does all kinds of weird things at its um, annual conventions, which endorses candidates, which irks a lot of us to a great degree. But there is almost no relationship, no connect that I, connection that I can see between the way we behave for good or ill as reporters and the way our union behaves. Um, you know, you can charge us with being leaning too much to the, the left or, you know, at this current juncture, the Washington Post is uh, now I read um, a, a right-wing rag that's defending President Bush and clearly is, uh, you know, uh, deep inside the Republican Party. That's our current image. Uh, you can charge us for being um, uh, wrong and uh, wrong-headed, but it has nothing to do with who represents us in the union. In my view, having watched teachers teach for t 20 years, is that the NEA has almost no effect on what's going on in American classrooms. Um, and um, Peter doesn't really argue the opposite. I mean, I looked for him to try to prove me wrong, and he didn't. That wasn't his concern. He didn't. He doesn't go inside the classroom in this book. Um, he instead uh, looks um, closely at what's happening uh, on much larger cosmic issues as to where we are in terms of the entire education system and where we could be if we didn't have unions. Um, and uh, he may have a point. I mean, he's, it's essentially, this is an argument about the future. Um, as he says, um, the uh, union structure is part of a structure that, you know, limits choice, um, um, makes it difficult for experiments to begin and prosper, um, uh, may get, limits all kinds of uh, chances of reform. But as he also says, and I'm delighted to hear him uh, re-emphasize today, uh, if we remove the unions, we would still have a problem. I think American education um, 
uh, is um, stuck uh, in part because we don't tra train teachers adequately. We don't really prepare them for the challenges they meet in the classroom. And, I, and when I talk about our problem, you know, er, Peter and I are middle class uh, residents of this country. Uh, our kids' educations are going to be fine simply because we're their parents. And I suspect every, all, er, almost everybody in this room fits that same category. It doesn't matter where you send your kids to school. You're going, obviously going to send them to a, a, a school. And the fact that they are your kids means they're going to have a fine education. The problem in American education is the bottom 25 percent of kids who do not have parents of our background who are not getting the support they need in the schools. And we haven't figured out a way to raise them up to the level where they can be productive citizens. Um, and uh, it could. There has yet to be the, the flaw in, in Peter's argument and the flaw of the argument of all um, University of Chicago assaults back to Milton Friedman and beyond on, on this, um, on their notion that we have to free up the system is that there, we don't have any um, uh, real experiments that show that it will work. And we have the Edison schools who have tried to break up the system, do things in a different way on a, on a for-profit basis. And in certain schools, they're doing a little bit better than the regular public schools, but there isn't really a defining difference between how their achievement scores are going and, and general achievement scores are going. So I think probably that there's more we have to learn before we figure out how to fix our schools. Um, I mean, Peter in, in, the, in the future may turn out to be right. And in fact, I, I hope he is. We're, we're stuck. And as I say, there are best students are doing fine, but the bottom 25% are not getting the lessons that they need. So I, I applaud Peter as he swings his two by four, and I hope he hits all the, the right targets. And there may be come a point in which we will see that his book is the beginnings of a movement that will get us to a place where we really can change the way we teach and the way we help our kids. Thanks. Okay, before we go to Q&A, I'll, uh, um, I'll ask if uh, uh, you have some comments you'd like to make okay, in response you. to it. Uh, I'm so uh, stunned by uh, Jay's generosity that I'm more or less rendered speechless. Uh, and it'll take me some time to think of things to say. Uh, I will, uh, uh, on this point about the northern states, uni unionized states doing better than the southern, less unionized states, which is one the union likes to make, the problem is, of course, you've got to factor out the racial issue. Uh, American uh, kids score systematically differently according to what race they are for reasons which, you know, are very debatable. But if you, if you look purely at the white scores in the South, uh, uh, they're fairly comparable uh, with, with, the, uh, with the northern states. Uh, as far as the impact of unions in the classroom, I mean, one very powerful one that comes, uh, uh, strikes me is, is, I mean, right off the bat, there's no way of paying a good teacher. So the whole teaching, uh, I mean, if you're in public schools, it's kind of, kind of depressing places because none of these teachers can, can uh, they're just not rewarded for anything that they do. They're rewarded on the basis of what the credentials are and what the union's carved out for them. And I think that has a number of odd effects. For example, I think quite a lot of teachers are very bored. And that's why they're constantly trying to push through programs about environmentalism and math and things like that, in, which we have in, uh, in, uh, in, in Connecticut. Uh, they, they, they don't have a way of... Uh, of, of uh, being rewarded for, for, for efforts, and that's entirely due to the union. Uh, uh, and finally, if, if the soil little homework, why do I have to stay up late, late with my 11-year-old? Well, you are in a very, obviously, upper crust of American education that uh, brings this average up, but most people don't have your problem, which I wish more parents did. <clears throat> okay, we'll now go to our question and answer session. I know you have some things that you'd like to ask uh, both Peter and Jay. Uh, our ground rules for our Q&A are that uh, please wait until the microphone is brought to you so that it does, uh, your question is picked up on the recording. And then uh, please be sure to ask a question rather than give a speech that it helps as well. Um, I'd like to, to uh, I know some of you may ask if we invited a representative from the NEA or the AFT to come to our farm today. And the answer to that question is yes, we did, and they both declined to participate. Uh, so if uh, perhaps uh, Peter can tell you about uh, other places where, or if he's getting any kind of a response from them. But uh, we'll go now to our questions. So why don't we go ahead and start over on this side. Uh, how about this gentleman right here? Hi, my name is Richard Burnham. I went to a very small public school in upstate New York in the 50s. There, one of my best teachers was a science teacher who had previously worked at Los Alamos. I also, before uh, going further, would, would, 
would note also that we have three times as many administrators in the same size school now as we did in the 50s. So you're absolutely right there. But on th this man we hired, I'm not sure that we could hire him today because he didn't have a year or two of educational programs, uh, you know, philosophy of education, all that stuff, which doesn't teach you any science whatsoever. Uh, is it the fault of the teachers' unions that we have these kinds of silly requirements? Do they strengthen these silly requirements? And how do we get rid of them? I don't know which of you wants to answer that. I would say absolutely it's the fault of the teacher union. They, they want to have uh, restrictions on uh, on entry into the, into the business because it's the one way to keep up uh, prices. It's a very simple, uh, uh, from an economic standpoint, it's a very simple thing. Now you have to fault the education schools. I mean, there's another um, um, problem, a separate interest group, education schools, who are great cash cows for American universities and who uh, like to make sure that they get as many students as possible and those kind of regulations help them. Well, well, the teacher union is, to some extent, capturing these education skills, isn't it? I mean, there's a, they, they are trying to do their best to get control of the credentializing process. Um, it's a good question. I think they are a great, two great powers with mutual interest, but I don't see them, I don't see the teachers union being able to move them in, as fine, but obviously they have the same views. Okay, let's go to the next question. How about on this side? All right here. Uh, Bruce Greenberg, Brinkman Publishing Company. I believe there's data showing that teachers, by and large, are among the less able college graduates. And um, the t when you talk to people about this, they say, well, if we raise the price level, we would be recruiting more able people and we wouldn't have the less able college graduates. How would you answer that? My answer would be that the union actually prevents people, school boards from, from bidding up the price of certain teachers who are in demand, like math teachers and science teachers. Its, a, it's insistence is that everybody be uh, paid the same right across the board. Uh, so it becomes very difficult to, uh, to really raise prices in, uh, to salaries enough to attract, attract good teachers. Uh, the, the, the salary levels and benefit levels of teachers have been rising very steadily over a very long period of time. Uh, so uh, if it was going to work, it, uh, uh, if these global increases that they're going for were, were going to work, they would have worked. But uh, there, you know, there's lots of studies about this now, and money is certainly important. But the other thing that's equally as important is the, is the condition, the working conditions in the school in particular. Does the school have a focus? Is the principal good? Are you, is the school actually going to make some difference in the life of these kids? And you're finding some experiences, such as the KIPP schools, that don't pay you know, substantially more, but recruit kids from very good colleges and find that they do wonderfully because they have a focus and a purpose for being in a school that actually works. You see, these public school teachers have a, d a very miserable life, you know. They're, they really are controlled to an extraordinary degree by these amazing lesson plans and things that are imposed on them. And you find often, if you talk to private school teachers, it's exactly to avoid this kind of bureaucracy that they go to private schools where they actually earn less money. Uh, uh, but the union likes to centralise the, all, all these... Uh, I mean, it's, it doesn't mind top-down uh, top bureaucracy because that's what gives it its power. Okay, let's go one more on this side. How about uh, here in the back? Hi. <clears throat> My name is Mike Peavity, and uh, I know Jay. Hi, Mike. I don't know Mr. Brimelow. This is half speech, half question. Uh, Jay, when you talked about the, uh, your own union, um, that union, of course, is not in a monopoly industry. The teachers' union is in a monopoly industry, and uh, therefore, uh, the, the people who uh, they control or bargain with are, have no assets at risk when the teachers come to bargain. Also, I think it's the only union in the United States where, through the election process, the teachers control their own bosses. And in fact, when they come to bargain at the table, they in fact are on both sides of it, which is not the case in any other union. Um, my question is really how we can break this, and I wondered if anyone has considered, and you, Mr. Brimlow, perhaps, um, putting the unions under the, the Hatch Act, which means that they are disallowed from political action uh, governing their own jobs, which uh, is, of course, the case with federal 
employees. Well, I'll just say Peter in his book suggested that and several other things to break up the union's power. And he said, honestly, at the beginning of that chapter, you know, I'm not going to constrain myself by what is politically practical, and that's not politically practical. I wish it were. Yeah, the, uh, 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 that's exactly right. Uh, I, I uh, say in my wish, when I have my wish list chapter that we shouldn't, um, w I don't think we should be constrained by what's politically practical because actually nobody knows what's politically practical. I'm old enough to remember when wage, wage and price controls were considered politically inevitable and on, on, on our, are you old enough to remember that, David? <laughs> yeah, obviously not. Uh, and, 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 you know, nobody expects the Soviet Union to collapse. So I think we should, what we should do is, is, is look for what's analytically right and then worry about the politics later. And what you're proposing is analytically right. Okay, let's go up here. All right, All right here in the front. Uh, yes, Mr. Mr. Brimwell, uh, you made a comment that the unions are especially effective not at getting what they want but preventing what it is they don't want and I think I've observed lately that H-1B visas and maybe other visas have been used to bring people foreigners into the country um, and is that a sign of the unions weakening and and is that a practical way of uh, I'm gonna say breaking the unions but uh, changing that union behavior uh, I feel obliged not to get into the immigration issue here because I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid it might upset Ed Crane and bring him down from wherever he is at the moment and throw me out. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, you know, the, the, the union, has, oddly enough, has, has never shown any resistance to immigration, although it's quite clearly a big problem in the, in the classrooms. Um, in fact, they've actually been in favor of uh, bilingual education, which often means the uh, arrival of, uh, of in, in the California, for example, they actually import Mexican school teachers to teach in, the, uh, they were importing Mexican school teachers to teach in the, in the Spanish immersion classes. They don't really care where you come from as long as you're in the union. Uh, and and that, so I, I, I would be reluctant to see immigration as a solution to the, to the uh, American school problem. Let's go to, we have one more up here in the front. Okay, right here. <clears throat> I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consulting engineer. Uh, how does this affect the teaching of math and science? Uh, Jay Matthews had mentioned Jaime Escalante, and you'd mentioned the problem of a pay differential. But what can be done on this to solve this particular problem? Well, I think the teacher trust has to be busted and the uh, educators, the educational authorities have to be allowed to hire whoever they want and whenever they want. Uh, 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 it's, it's as simple as that and that's the, that's the argument I make. I mean, I, that's, I, think he's, I think that's a real weak spot. You know, I'm, I'm much more a belief in incremental change and if enough parents in a school district find that the math and science education is insufficient because they can't hire qualified people, I think that there would be a demand for paying them more and I think school board would have to go along with it, no matter what the union said. But again, you see, it requires parents to give up evenings and harass the school board and all this kind of thing, and that's, that's something which then, which parents, uh, uh, it's difficult to get parents to do that. The, the union is in a much better position to, to control this, this, this political process than parents are. Okay, I'm just trying to move around the room a little bit. Why don't we go right here? <clears throat> uh, this is for Brimola. You said, um, one of the, and this is something that I know a lot of advocates of school choice say, they, they say that uh, if we had more school choice, especially in a market system, you would see teachers being uh, paid according to merit rather than um, what they usually use. And I think they usually use some, some sort of seniority system. Um, however, my mom is a teacher and she teaches in a private school in the Catholic school system. In the Catholic school system, it doesn't really work like that. They don't have merit increases. They do a seniority system very similar to the public school system. And I was wondering if you had any data which on other types of private schools or in private schools that I don't have any, you know, any kind of affiliation with that, that they do sort of do that. Because I just, in my personal experience, I don't see that happening in the private markets. The weakness with the current private sector, of course, is that it's not a profit-making sector. Uh, th these non-profit institutions have disincentives and problems of their own. 
uh, what we're talking about is applying uh, economic concepts uh, to uh, an industry which is totally socialized. And that's and Jay's right, we're talking about the future. But it's not an experiment. We have a lot of work. Economics is a science. We have a lot of uh, knowledge about what economic structures that work and economic structures that don't work. And, and uh, uh, the, the American K through 12 system is an economic structure that doesn't, that doesn't work. And sadly, a lot of American teachers would be very uncomfortable being in a system where they were being paid significantly more because they were judged to be better teachers. Actually, a lot of American school managers will be uncomfortable. Yeah. One of the curious, I, I was just going to say, you know, one of the invidious things about the current situation is that the, um, the K through 12, uh, the public K through 12 sector is sort of stinking up the whole of the education industry because uh, the habits of mind and mores and so on that, they, that they developed in that sector spread throughout the edu educational sector. Uh, you see this in the National Health Service in Britain. Uh, even the private doctors uh, work, uh, you know, according to the, 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 the patterns that you see in the National Health Service. I have, we have friends here from National Right to Work. I remember they, they told me some years ago that they were actually, um, they've come across employers who will, in Britain, who was heavily unionized, who will say things like, well, if we didn't have unions, how would we set wages? <laughs> they're, like, they're like pit ponies, you see. They've gone blind in this, in this confined system. <laughs> Okay, back here. Yes. Mr. Brimwell, you had mentioned um, something about the divide between younger teachers and the unions and how they're having, unions are having a hard time recruiting and keeping younger teachers. I was wondering if you could speak more about that. I have friends who, uh, who are teaching and they've become disillusioned with their unions. And the one selling point that I remember the them telling me about the unions making to them was, well, you have to belong to the union because if you don't, what if some kid sues you? Who's going to protect you? And that's, as I understand it, that's such a small part of what teachers unions do. I was wondering if you could talk about uh, that aspect of union activity or, or uh, more generally about the, the divide between younger teachers and the unions. Uh, there are really two questions there, but the second one is a very important one. A lot of what the union does is providing various services to teachers, uh, and that's actually how most teachers see it. They see it as a source of discounting magazines and so on. Uh, so one of the proposals I make in this book is that, is that uh, uh, school boards or, or, or government school system in general should interpose itself between the union and the teachers and provide a lot more of these services. But the union doesn't like that. In, in, um, in Tennessee some years ago, Lamar Alexander actually tried to provide from the state uh, liability insurance to teachers against exactly what you're describing, being sued by parents. And the union fought it. They said it was a union busting tactic. So the answer is that that's, uh, you know, that, that is certainly one thing that, that must be done, but the union will fight. But then it's going to fight everything, I suggest, so it, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, the, the other point you're making, what, what state are your friends in, by the way? Virginia is a, is a relatively enlightened state in terms of its legal environment, and it's actually possible for them not to join the union. There are states where, uh, where there are agency fee states, where if, even if you don't join the union, you're going to be paying most of the dues, uh, and, and that does tend to compel people to join. Uh, it matters. The legal environment is the critical thing, but in states where teachers don't have to join, uh, they, they, are, they, they, reach, they seem to be maxing out. They seem to be reaching the, the limit of the number of, of t teachers that can get into the system. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. Okay, Charlene. I'm Charlene Har with the Education Policy Institute. I'm anxious to read your book, Peter. I haven't done so, but the question that I have is for you, Mr. Matthews. Um, you acknowledge that education reporters uh, rarely cover teacher unions and their activities and I would ask you why not oh. because in some of the responses that you've given today it's pretty clear that you don't understand the reaches of the teacher unions and the um, uh, interlocking, interlocking, interlocking directorates for instance and the impact that they that the union actually has on accreditation uh, systems and all kinds of other things. So why don't reporters uh, I, I, cover I, I more? I didn't make my point very clear. The, the reason why is because I've been spending 20 years inside of classrooms looking at what works and what do, does not. And it's clear to me that what works in classrooms and what does not work in classrooms has almost nothing to do with the existence or non-existence of teachers unions. Um, 
There. Sure. And, 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 and if I see something that isn't working, I ask a lot of questions about it, both of teachers, principals, and so on. I've yet to have any of the hundreds of uh, successful teachers and principals and counselors and superintendents I've interviewed over the last 20 years tell me we really, we really could do our jobs, our kids could learn better if we didn't have these union rules to, to, to inhibit us. It, is not, it does not have an impact, impact on the basic uh, facts of learning or not learning in classrooms. It has lots of impact on um, the structure of the education system. Uh, and if we changed it, perhaps that structure would eventually lead to a point where we could affect uh, what's going on in the classroom. But there's no proof of that yet. And as far, as far as what's going on in the classrooms now, there seems to be no impact for good or ill, Ill from teachers unions. That's why we don't cover them. Okay, well, that's a conversation we can continue during lunch. I know there were hands that I wasn't able to get to, but I would like to invite you to stay. We do have lunch upstairs. Um, um, Peter will be escorted upstairs to the book signing table where he can sign books for you, and you can also ask him questions there if you'd like to continue this conversation. Uh, Again, thank you so much for joining us, and I'd like to thank uh, Peter Brimelow and Jay Matthews for their participation. Peter Brimelow is author of The Worm in the Apple, published by HarperCollins. Visit HarperCollins.com for more information.